Now, we're going to get into the manual here. <clears throat> I'm going to touch on this real quick. There's <clears throat> a question. <clears throat> maybe you didn't really, maybe I wasn't clear yesterday. <clears throat> uh, it says, is martial arts compatible with our Christian faith that promotes love, gentleness, and compassion? No, it's not. <clears throat> it is not. Um, <clears throat> I'd practiced it from age nine up until, for, yeah, up until about 1995 or somewhere to there. <clears throat> and I don't practice anymore. Uh, why would we need to rely on guns and swords or knives to protect us? You shouldn't. Uh, shouldn't Jesus be our protector? Yes, he is, and he will. And I've actually been better protected using his name than before. So, um, <clears throat> he will protect you. I could give you some neat examples, but I don't have time. So, um, okay. <clears throat> okay, just as... If you gave me this, okay, I'm not going to read it exactly because I don't think it might not be taken right the way I say it, <laughs> okay? So if you remember this, okay, if this is you. So, <clears throat> but just <clears throat> let me put it this way. According to the Bible, according to James 5, <clears throat> if a person cannot pray the prayer of faith and get a person healed, they shouldn't be an elder. Okay? That should be one of the requirements of being an elder. So, okay. <clears throat> if you ask me that question, you know what I'm referring to, and there you go. Okay? Now, <clears throat> uh, when, yeah, when someone is faced with much opposition, how do they get past the point of no return? Usually it's by making a fool out of yourself. Uh, I, I'll, I'll explain that. Uh, to have the faith to simply believe the Word of God no matter what the circumstances, to receive from Him what He has promised. Yeah. Um, really, it comes back to just being willing to make a fool out of yourself, and sometimes you have to. Uh, one of the fastest ways to get out of sin, let's say you, <clears throat> you know, let's say you drink, then the, one of the fastest ways to get out of that is whatever bar you like going to is you put on a big old Jesus t-shirt <laughs> and then you walk in that bar and you get up in the middle of that place and you start preaching real loud <clears throat> and you give an altar call and you do the whole thing. I mean, you just go after it completely and you probably won't ever go back there again. <clears throat> okay, so... <laughs> <coughs> it's a real good way <laughs> to um, find out what's going on. Now, <clears throat> so there's a lot of these things that, that we're going to be talking about, but how do you get past that point of no return, believe in the Word of God? I'm telling you, you just, because this is really what it comes down to, is that this Word has to be more real to you than anything else. Now, the only way to get there that I know of really is just you, you live in it. You you. What you give yourself to, you become. And that's why most of your lives look like soap operas. Right? Because that's what you watch, that's what you think about, that's what you talk about. <clears throat> okay? Or, you know, whatever it is, uh, you know, singing contest, dance contest, whatever it is you watch on television, that's what you pour yourself into, then don't complain whenever, you know, whenever next time you need help, then call, what's his name, Simon Cowell or whoever he is, Okay? <clears throat> see if he can give you a word, okay? I'm sure he's got some, but you might not want to hear him. <clears throat> so, um, I, I tell you, you just have to decide what's important. And what's important is what you'll give yourself to. Now, for me, I, you know, the, the, the thing is with me, I'm healthy. I live healthy, but I, I'm not healthy because I preach. Because there's a lot of people that preach that aren't healthy. Right? A lot of people believe in healing, aren't healthy. But, I, am, I don't have to preach to be healthy, and I don't have to preach, I don't have to do this. I, I could go home and be at home and believe this, and it would still work. I'd still stay healthy, and I'd still, you know, it would be real in my life. But, and even if I did that, I'd still live in this book. You understand? I don't read this, and I don't study it and keep it with me all the time because I'm a preacher. You know, I'm a preacher because I had this book with me and I studied it all the time. You, you understand the difference? I was reading this book and studying this book and living in this book and doing what I said to do be way before I was ever asked to preach. And so, this thing has to be more real. <coughs> this has to be more real than your friends. This thing will separate you from friends. And you have to decide, what is it worth? I mean, honestly, <clears throat> when I look at this, for me and my family, this book has meant everything. And so, and now, 
for literally thousands of, thousands of other people. This book meaning so much to me has meant whether they have a grave or not. Do you understand? And, and under, I, believe me, I, I, underst- I believe in the, the, the Ephesians 4 giftings and, and I, I know there's a, you know, callings to special ministry, so to speak, you know, to an area of ministry. But there's not a person in this room that can't preach this gospel. And if you're a Christian, you're supposed to be doing it. Do you understand? Not necessarily behind the pulpit. But to people, you should be discipling someone. And that doesn't mean some weird thing. It just means all a discipler is is a person that takes someone along that wants to learn and they just share with them what they know. And they become in, involved in their life. So anybody can do this. You know, what I do is not... <clears throat> what I do is special. The fact that I do it, I'm not special. Do you understand what I mean by that? The, the, the ministry and the ministry of the word is, is special. I mean, it's, a, it's an entity of itself. You know, me being able to do it, it's not, I'm not able to do it because I'm special. I'm, the reason I do this is because I have a moral obligation to share what I know. That's why I do it. You know, God didn't appear to me in a bright light and say, you know, you go and do this. He didn't do that. If I told you my call up my how I <clears throat> recognize my call to ministry, <laughs> you probably wouldn't like it because it wasn't like Paul on the road to Damascus. Or it's just I realized that me preaching the gospel could do more good for more people for a longer time than anything else I could do. And that's what I started doing. And then, <clears throat> now I, d- I didn't have a message until... After my daughter died and I was looking for truth and I found a, a, a piece of truth concerning healing that works real good. And so we just started sharing that. <clears throat> now, so it's not a, you know, you know a, a, am I in the five-fold ministry? Yeah, I fulfill a, a, a calling in that. But the bottom line is I just got filled with the Word of God and have to share what, what I learned. So, you know, it's twofold. Number one, if you want to do that, that's how you do it. Don't go to somebody and try to get them to put you in the ministry. Get the Word of God in you, and your ministry will find you, and the people that need you will find you. So they, they found John the Baptist, and he was out in the middle of the wilderness. <clears throat> he didn't have to put commercials on TV. Right? If you have a message, people will find you. God will direct people to you. We were in, in the middle of Arkansas, and out in the woods, you understand when I say woods, you know what I mean? But what, that means out in the middle of nowhere, you know? And there's a little house, a little bitty white house, used to be a crack house. And a lady heard about it, and the police couldn't keep the you know, crack addicts out of there. So the lady bought the house from the people, and they went out there and literally cleaned the thing out, completely restored it, and turned it into a church. And it was amazing. The police couldn't keep the crack addicts out, but when she turned it into a church, <laughs> they all left. <clears throat> okay, so, and she, I was coming back from a meeting, and she had heard about us somehow, and she called and said, would you come to, uh, just out, well, she said to Hot Springs, Arkansas, and then she went from there, I said, yeah, I'll come, and she said, okay, well, I've, I've already got a ticket, um, she said, I got you a ticket to this airport, and from there, we'll have a plane pick you up and bring you in, and so she had a, a plane there that, I didn't even know anything about her, but apparently, she was apparently pretty well off. And she had them pick me up in her plane and then took me to Hot Springs. I, my, my team that I had with me at that point, they all went on home and I had to go from one meeting to another meeting and I didn't know what was going on, but <clears throat> they brought me there and kind of find out they had representatives of um, Benny Hinn's mi- uh, ministry, Oral Roberts, uh, Clement Humbard, which was Rex Humbard's brother. I don't know if he was the one that put Catherine Kuhlman on television, actually. And <clears throat> several other major ministries and they were all in this house, and they said, we've heard about what you're preaching, and we want to hear it straight from you. And so for two days, I stood there and preached in this little bitty house in the middle of nowhere. No directions, no signs, nothing. No advertised meeting, nothing on the website, nothing. Nobody knew I was there. <clears throat> in the beginning of the second day, cars started pulling up. <laughs> pulling up in the driveway. The people came out and knocked on the door of the 
it didn't look like a church, it looked like a house. And the lady went to the door and said, can I help you? And she, they, they said, well, uh, we, we just want to know what's going on here. And she said, well, right now we're in the middle of a meeting. They said, well, we were over here somewhere else. It was like a state over. I said, we were there. We were praying. And God said, get in your car and go here, and I'll tell you where to go. And he guided them to the meeting. Right up. No, no advertisement, nothing. And then it, that started happening about every hour. Pretty soon we had a crowd there. Then we had a healing service. People started getting healed, and the men that, all the men that were there, basically there was only one or two of them there that needed healing. They got healed, but they got to see how people got healed as we prayed for them, and it, it impacted these other ministries. And so you don't see, ministry isn't having your name on a card and having a banner out front. Ministry is sharing life into other people that changes their lives. Right? Now, you can, you can, if you can do that and have a card, but having a card doesn't make you do that. See, all you got to do is you got to love God, you got to love y- your neighbor. That's it. You got you got to love them to the point that you'll do whatever it takes to get them free. Whatever it takes, however long it takes, whatever, you never stop, you never quit, you never back off, you never lay it down, you never give up, you never say, "Well, it must not be God's will." No, it's not your will. That's why you're quitting. Thank God Jesus' will wasn't like yours. Right? He didn't quit. He kept going. He kept pushing through. Regardless, even though he knew what was coming. So, and see, it's funny because when I say that, <clears throat> in a few minutes here, you know, we, we're, we're going to get into chapter one. <laughs> 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 but, but I don't know if you realize or not, but chapter one says the word of God is our ultimate rule of faith and action. Now, isn't that what you've been hearing for the last two days? Okay, then we've been in chapter 1 for the last two days, okay? <clears throat> now, but in a minute, I, I'm going to take you into some things because there's really only one message you need to know about healing, and there's only two things that you need to know. One is you need to know, is it God's will, and is it in the atonement? And really, if you find out if it's in the atonement, then you know it's God's will because it can't be in the atonement and not be God's will. But once you figure out that it is in the atonement and therefore it is God's will and therefore it's always God's will, then that means it can never not be God's will. Now see, once you get to that point, everything else is downhill. Because most of your problems in healing come from the fact that you're not convinced totally and completely that it is always, in every case, in every situation, God's will to set them free. And as long as you think, because it's amazing, you go to almost every Pentecostal, charismatic, whatever group, that say they believe in healing. And you look at their statement of faith, and almost every one of them will say, we believe that physical divine healing is the will of God and is in the atonement. You know, in the atonement of Jesus Christ. What, almost every one of them have that. And yet, if you, if you talk to them about it, they will say, well, yeah, healing's in the atonement, but. And but means, you know, any time that they don't see it, it's not God's will. So you have to realize, <clears throat> there. listen, th- this is really simple. All you have to do is settle it. Most people, are never, they never settle it. That's the difference. Most people are always wondering. That's when they're tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. People come through, well, healing's always God's will. Yep, that's good. Well, oh, healing, sometimes it's not God's will to heal because he's trying to teach you something. Well, that makes sense. I'll go over here. See? Well, you know, but God does want everybody healed because it, you know, it's better that if everybody's healed. Than, well, yep, I think everybody should be healed. You're tossed to and fro. You know, settle it. You know, you can be my friend, you can be my enemy. I don't care which, just pick one. Right? Don't make me think you're my friend when you're really my enemy. <clears throat> right? If you're my enemy, I want to know not to turn my back to you. Right? I mean, you know, friend or foe, it doesn't matter. Just pick one. Pick a side. You know, don't be wishy-washy. Be settled. Well, it's the same thing. Be settled. Is it God's will or is it not? Well, you know, but he's trying to teach you something. Then it's not God's will. Well, no, it's always God's will. But... You can't have it both ways. If it's always God's will, it's always God's will. See, your problem really doesn't lie in the understanding of God's will. Your problem lies in your understanding of God. See, you believe that there's some darkness in God. That's what you believe. If you believe that it's sometimes not God's will to heal, you believe that there is variableness in Him. 
You believe there is some shadow of turning in him. You believe he's not always the same yesterday, today, and forever. You believe that there is some darkness in him because he will use some evil to try to turn you around. God is not the author, author of evil. You understand? He's not the author of sickness and disease. And he doesn't use the devil as his, you know, corrector. The Holy Spirit is the corrector. The Word of God is the corrector. He chastises you with his word, not with cancer. You understand that? And the fact that you believe that, well, but, you know, sometimes God uses sickness. No, no. You got smart in the middle of it. That's all it is. It's not him using it. Him using it means that it was part of his plan for it to happen. See, you think sometimes that everything, you think that everything Jesus did, like the saying, um, well, you know, Jesus only did what he saw his father do, so you can't just walk around doing that. Well, depends on what you mean by that, because that word sees actually means to perceive or understand. It doesn't mean he saw him with his physical eyes. I mean, I mean, think about it. If that was true, then when the centurion came to Jesus and said, my servant lies at home sick of the palsy, Jesus, according to the scripture, Jesus jumped up and said, I'll come and heal him. The centurion said, nope, it's not right. I'm not worthy you should come into my roof if you just speak the word. Well, if Jesus only did what he saw his father do, and if he always knew beforehand what, it, what was going to happen, then that means that he would have known that the centurion was going to come. He'd have known the centurion was going to say, no, don't come to my house, so he wouldn't have jumped up and said, I'll go. He would have just said, oh, okay, well, you just want me to speak the word. Here you go. But he didn't do all that, so that means he didn't see it beforehand. <clears throat> Believe it or not, Jesus had to walk by faith just like you and I do. If he didn't, he didn't please the Father, because without faith, it's impossible to please the Father. So Jesus had to walk by faith too. Right? And walking by faith means that there's always a possibility of failure. Right? Now, if you truly walk in faith, truly, the possibility of failure is not a real possibility. <laughs> Amen? But basically what it comes down to is you have to get to the point where you say, if God doesn't come through, this whole thing's going to fall apart. Right? But then you know, because I'm in faith, it'll come, God will come through. And so you just keep on walking. That's why people don't understand people that walk in faith because they don't make sense. You know? They don't have wisdom. Well, brother, you've got to use wisdom. I am using wisdom. I'm using divine wisdom, not earthly wisdom. Right? Earthly wisdom is devilish. Divine wisdom is divine. Yeah, I don't make provision for the flesh. I don't make provision to fail. I don't have a plan B. Right? Plan A. Plan A says, Bible says this, that's what it'll be. We don't stop till we get there. <clears throat> you keep on going. You don't stop. <clears throat> you See, faith knows what the end's going to be from the beginning. And then it just keeps walking there until that ending is seen. See, in, in the beginning, you can't see it. If you can see it, it's not faith. See, anybody can jump in when they can see it. And if you can do it on your own, you don't need faith. Right? You only need faith when you can't do it on your own. So until you get to the point of the impossible, you can't get into faith. You understand? <clears throat> but as long as you think that you, well, you know, well, if they can't help me, then I'll, you know, I got my doctor's appointment. Just go ahead and take plan B. You understand? Because you, you're already making provision. That's the thing. At some point, you just got to settle it. What's real? Is it real? Is it true? If it is, let's go with it. If it's not, hey, come on. Let's, what are we wasting our time? I, I'm, I'm highly pragmatic in that sense. If, if it's not God, believe me, I'm not going to waste my time if it's not real. <clears throat> why, why, would I, why would I want to give my life for something that's not real? You know, and have to live by rules, so to speak. Not rules God made, but rules church makes. Right? <clears throat> the hardness of Christianity is not the rules God has put down. It, it's all the rules that God didn't make, that Christians make, that you have to live by, or else they don't think you're right. Right? I mean, all this stuff, because you have to, you have to word things just right. Or else they'll think, you know, you, well, you don't have the right spirit or that kind of stuff. And that's not true. Paul worded things very wrong. You know, Paul wouldn't even be allowed to preach in most of our churches today. 
the words he used, the things he said. I mean, you think about some of the stuff he said. I'm coming, and when I get there, where I'm going to see all these people that run their mouth. I'm, I'm giving you the paraphrase of what he said. These people are talking big. When I get there, we'll see who's got the power. That's what he said. He said, if any man think otherwise, God will show him where he's wrong. I mean, think about that. It doesn't sound too humble. Well, it depends what you mean by humble. All humility is, is finding out what the Bible says about you and then saying that about you yourself. Being humble doesn't say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm just nothing, I don't count. I don't. No, that's not being humble. Because you're not nothing. God didn't send his son for nothing. You're important enough for God to send his son. You are worth Jesus to God. So don't act like you're nothing. You don't, like, don't act like you're something either. Okay? because <laughs> see, that's, <clears throat> see that, that's the beauty of this thing though see this, the, the teaching about anointing and stuff like that it makes somebody special and it makes somebody better than somebody else but the amazing thing is if you find out what the Bible says everybody can do it well if everybody can do it then nobody can get in pride over it how can I be in pride if, if you can do what I can do see I can't get in pride over that I can only get in pride if I think I can do something you can't do and the anointing teaching that's out there tries to tell people that. Well, he's anointed, so he can do things that the others can't, so he's special. And then we tell them they're special, and then, you know, we, we build them up, and then when they start believing what we tell them, we get mad at them because they act special. <laughs> they didn't ask to be treated special, but we treat them special. Well, the reality is there ain't nobody special here but Jesus. Right? I mean, you know when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, on that donkey, and they started laying down palm leaves and Hosanna and looking and standing. You know that donkey thought, <laughs> I must be well liked here. <laughs> you know? Yeah, this is the way a donkey is supposed to be treated here. <clears throat> Wait till I get back to the corral and tell them how they treated me when I came into Jerusalem. <laughs> and the donkey forgot it. It was one on his back that they were yelling at. Amen? And the donkey was probably thankful a week later. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> See, that's what you always got to... Whenever Paul and Barnabas went into town, and, and Paul and Timothy and all those guys went in, the first thing they went to get there, oh, these are the gods from heaven have come down. And they started talking, talking like they're gods. And by sundown, they're in prison. <laughs> right? One minute you're a god, the next minute you're a devil. Why? Because that's in people's minds. People will take you from being a god to a devil that quick. Right? So the main thing is, don't listen to either of it. Know who you are in Christ. It doesn't matter what people think about you, what they say about you. All that counts is what he says about you. He said, well, I don't know what he says about you. Read this. He tells you what he said about you. This is you. You understand? This is what he said about you. This is who he wants you to grow up to be. This is who you are now. And he just wants you to renew your mind so you can be seen that. Amen? And once you do that, you, you say, well, you know, we're not getting into a lot about healing. Yeah, we are, believe it or not. Jesus never taught healing. See, that's why I said the church is so backwards because Jesus used healing to verify his words. We use his words to verify healing. Do you understand? It's backwards. We don't, we don't have to prove anything. All we got to do is be obedient. I don't have to prove this. It, it proves itself. If you do it, it'll work. But we always think, well, we got to prove healing. Well, cause, why? Because we're always, for some reason, especially Pentecostals, Charismatics, we've always felt like the stepchild that the church didn't want. So we always have to prove. See, we're right. We want vindication. We want to prove we're right. Forget being right. Be helpful. Help people. Love people, touch lives. What? And it's amazing because we always get back to this. We always get back to the point where, where now if the person wants healing, and, but, but if they don't want healing and we want to minister healing and, and it's a child and the parent doesn't want us to hear and, and we get caught up in this theology stuff that's not even real theology. And it's just human reasoning. You know, you want pure and simple theology? Real simple. Love God. Love your neighbor. 
do to them what you would have done to you. If you were sick, would you want somebody to come lay hands on you? Yes, then go do it. Now, would you want them to just touch you and go, okay, you'll be okay, bye-bye. Or would you want them to stay there and fight for you and tell that thing to get off of you? Then fight for them. Just love them like you would love yourself. Amen? Amen? Do for them what you would do for yourself. You, you say, what, but you know, what about this? What about that? No what about. I'm trying to get you past all that kind of stuff. I want, you to, I want you to come into what it's like to walk as a son or daughter of the living God. It's amazing. And see, people keep wanting more and more rules. What do I got to do? How do I pray? How do I say it? Why do I do this? It's not about that. You need to realize whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen? It's amazing. I watch these guys. I watch these other you know, seminars and stuff like that. And Oh, you got to do this. And when the pattern is right, the glory will fall. Let me tell you, you can't get the pattern right. Once you touch it, it's messed up. Right? Why? If, especially if you're doing it as a human. You just mess it up. You can't get the pattern right. What makes you think you can finish in the flesh what was started by the Spirit? But what do we always try to do? We try to live by do this, don't do that, touch this, don't touch that. If I live good enough, God can use me. You can't live good enough for God to use you. Do you understand? I'm not telling you don't live good. But your living good ought to be out of gratitude to God for what he's done for you, not to try to get him to do something else. There's not gratitude in that. You know, it's amazing. This thing is the easiest thing, and I'm, I'm, I'm having the time of my life. I'm telling you, it's good. It, there is nothing better. I open up my email box, you know, the inbox thing, and, you know, testimony, 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 testimony. From the, you know, many times, for, for, usually for six to eight weeks after we leave a place, we keep getting testimonies. Keep coming in. I'm still getting testimonies from Africa right now. People going back, getting tested, and finding things are gone, and it's amazing. And the thing is, it's so funny, I can, I'll, I can give you all these testimonies. And, and if you'll get the principle behind them, it's not just a testimony. There's things to learn in them. Because we had, you know, these, these people that, they want you to be a certain way. They think you have to be dramatic and theatrical. You know, that you got to do things this you know, all the pizzazz and the flash. And it's not that way. Now, do you play with it? Yeah, when you first start operating in power, yeah, you'll play with it. You will. You know, remember when Benny Hinn was taking his jacket off and waving it at people? What do you think he was doing? He was playing. He was experimenting. He was going, well, you know what he figured out? He figured out at that moment, I can do anything and it'll work. He broke out of the idea that I have to pray like this and say this and I have to do it like that and, oh, hit the song and let's get the music just right and let's get it. And if we get everything just right, then it'll happen. And he found out, you know what? If I wave my hand, the power of God will hit people. So what does he do? He starts waving his hand. He goes, I wonder if it'd work if I blew on him. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> it works! It's amazing because... When you get to that point, anything you do will work. Why? Because it's not a formula. It's not a method. It's life. You can walk past people like Peter in his shadow and they get in your shadow and they get healed. You can walk past people. Have you ever been in a place and a woman have on perfume and when she walks past, you can kind of walk, she walks this way and you walk that way and you walk through her perfume trail? You know what I'm talking about? It's, it's like a you know, jet stream of an airplane, you know, you know. I mean, you don't even see her now, but you just kind of, you like, and you can, you can walk in and back and out of it, you know what I'm saying? You, yeah, it's, hmm, you know, you ever notice that? But the Bible says that's the way we're supposed to be. We're supposed to have the aroma of life. Imagine that. Imagine walking through a place and somebody, you walk this way and somebody walks this way with a cane and when they walk through, all of a sudden they go, whoa. And, and they get absolutely healed, throw their cane down and go, I don't understand it. And you say, well, that wouldn't happen because God wouldn't get the glory. Really? So the angels, God, nobody's watching. No, what, what you mean is you wouldn't get the glory because you weren't the one laying the hands and going, what? Everybody gather around and watch. Watch what I'm going to do. 
You understand? Why? Because you're already walking off that way. That's the way it should be. You should just emanate life. There's nothing better than that. And, man, I mean, and, and think about this. Imagine you right now. Maybe you've never seen the power of God in your life. But imagine you going to somewhere like in, in Africa where I just come from. The whole section of the, they had a section in the church that is probably as many people as right here right now that they have to keep them separated in one section and it's called the HIV section. They can't even mingle with the other group. Can't even mingle with the other people. They have to sit in their own section and when they come in they have this paper on this is HIV and they have to sign in and they send them right over to this other section because the government says you have to stay separated over there. And they have them completely separated. Now imagine, imagine you right now. Imagine you go run, running over there with me. You and I are standing there. We're standing at the pulpit. We're looking out, and you see this section over there, and, and there's people lined up for healing, and I say, okay, I'm going to take the healing line here. You go over there. You wait in amongst those people and get them free. Think about that. Now, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about imagining what could happen. I'm saying as you are right now, what you know right now, you got to go get them free. you got to get that off of them. Imagine. Now, how would you feel? Totally helpless because you don't know because you know. Okay, that's, that's acceptable because you're thinking with your mind because you are, as a human, totally helpless. You understand? But you're not human. You're a son and daughter of the living God. You're not normal. You have something in you that no human has. Do you understand? Because the minute a human gets it, they become a son or daughter of God. You're not normal anymore. You, you can't fit in with that group anymore because you're different now. You have in you the spirit that created the world. I mean, think about that. I, I know that's hard to imagine, but you have in you, I, I'll tell you this. Here's how I learned some of this stuff. And like I said, a lot of times it's more accidental than, you know, on purpose. I travel a lot, as you know, and I went to a place, and we were in Georgia, <clears throat> and on, a lot of times when I get home, you know, I'm tired, I've been going constantly, and, you know, I try to let my voice rest and that kind of stuff, because I'm constantly praying, and, and even, you see, you just see me here, but you don't see me when we go back to motel room, we got in last night about 11, I didn't go to bed to about 2, and, and it wasn't just because I couldn't sleep, I, I could have slept, I slept in the car, <laughs> I fell asleep in the car last night you know, dozed off on the way in. So, uh, yeah, I was getting sleepy. <clears throat> but when I got there, I have pictures of people that I go to meetings, some in Africa, different places like that, that people that, you got to get it. You understand? You got to get it for them. If you don't, they're going to die. Well, see, I, this meeting, when I come to a meeting, <laughs> the rest of the world doesn't stop. <clears throat> you know, people don't say, oh, well, Curry's in meetings, so we won't call. No, they still call. They still email. My daughter was laughing the other day when I opened my email when I got back from Africa because we, we, we were on email while I was there, but I got back in and she said, well, I sent it to your email box. And I said, well, which one? And she said, told me this one. And I said, <coughs> okay, well, okay, it might take me a while to find it though. And she goes, why? I said, well, because I just checked a while ago and I got 4,332 emails <laughs> that are unread. I said, it may take me a little while to get through them. <coughs> and, and she just started laughing. She said, that's... How do you do that? And I said, I stay up. When you go home and go to bed, I stay up. I read the emails. I get pictures. I pray over these things. I, the, you see, this isn't just a game. This isn't, well, let me see how many emails I can get because I'm important and people want, you know, writing to me. It ain't that. Every email is somebody's life. You understand that? This isn't, this isn't games. People live or die based on whether you pray or not. They live or die. This isn't getting your name on the headline. This isn't being on the marquee. This is every day, every day. All faith is is showing up every day and doing the same thing. Well, you know, that's too boring for me. Okay. You know, <clears throat> I, I don't have to be an eagle. I can be an ox. You just keep plodding along. You just keep doing what you do. Why? It doesn't matter if people like you, don't like you, what they say about you. All that matters is you keep doing what's right. It's called moral obligation. You have an obligation to help if you can. That's why if you ask me to pray, I can't turn you down. I, I can't. It's not in me. You know, we, we have healing lines. I've never stopped praying for people in the healing line until every person was prayed for, ever. I've prayed for 
well over 2,000 people in one night. I kept praying until 2 o'clock in the morning one time. They came and got me and said, you've got to go back to the room. You've got to rest. You've got to get up in the morning and do this again. I said, you tell them. I can't tell them. Look at the next person in line. What's the matter with you? Terminal cancer, standing there with a tank thing. I'm like, you tell them. How can I tell them? I can't tell them to come back tomorrow. Why? Because I'm tired. I can pray for another person. I can pray for another one. I can pray for another one, whatever it takes. Why? Because there's always time to rest later. I mean, I understand you have to rest, but I also understand I can't turn you down because I know a lot of times whenever you send somebody home for that night, they either die that night or they don't come back. And I don't want that on me. I don't have a Messiah complex, okay? But I do know that the Messiah lives in me. And who I touch lives, and if I don't touch them, they may die. So I can't stop. I can't turn them away. And so <clears throat> we had... I was coming home one day. I got home from a trip, and my, you know, my family was already home, so to them it was just kind of another day life, and so they wanted to go to the mall. It was a Saturday morning. They wanted to go to the mall, and they had to exchange some stuff of something. <clears throat> and I don't go anywhere without a Bible or a book or something to read. Um, and so we're standing in line, and somehow this day I got off without a book, without my Bible, and I was not happy. I mean, I'm standing in line waiting for them to exchange stuff, and I'm wasting, to me, that's wasting time. And I hate to waste time. And so I'm standing there, and I'm not happy. I'm grumbling, and I'm thinking, I can, you know, I can leave y'all here. I'll go back home and get the Bible, get a book. And my wife said, no, you're not leaving us here. Just stay. It'll be okay. Just hang on. So I'm standing here thinking, okay. And I start looking around the mall. I'm thinking, there's got to be a bookstore here, you know. <clears throat> I'll go buy a book, you know, just so I can stand here in line and read. <laughs> so, and so I'm standing there. And, but I'm grumbling and I'm complaining, I'm murmuring, I'm not happy, I'm not praying in tongues, I'm not singing hallelujahs, you understand? There's, re there's a reason I'm telling you that. And about that time, these two, well actually it's three women, it was two women and a young girl, came in and she was, they were standing, you know how you see people but you don't really look at them but you know they're there? And <clears throat> I was standing there and I saw them walk in so I'm standing there grumbling and complaining, you know? Same thing that caused the earth to open up and swallow up all the Israelites. Same, same. I was doing the same thing. And so I'm standing there. And about that time, I felt right here on my side, I mean literally on my side, wasn't here, it was here. It was just about the size of my hand, right here. But it was like someone just took a lid off and water was going out. I mean, it was like I could feel it. Now, I'm not really given to a lot of stuff like that. I don't feel things all the time. I'm just, you know, you be healed, it's a fact. There you go, it's got to happen, that's it. I work in authority and dominion, really not by so much by feelings and stuff. And if, they, if I feel something, great, but I don't need it. And so <clears throat> I felt this flowing out. So I'm standing there grumbling and complaining. <laughs> and this was going, so I kind of notice and I look over. And I look, and there's this young girl standing there, and she had her head on her mom's shoulder, and you could tell she was not feeling good. And I knew this was going to her. I knew it was for her. Now, I would like to tell you, that because I felt the anointing flowing, that I walked over to her and said, you know, God has sent me over here to do but I didn't. Why? Because I was grumbling and complaining and not happy, right? I didn't want to do it any more than you would want to do it. I was tired. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to, you know, re I didn't want to go down the mall healing the sick. I didn't want to do anything. I was tired. I just wanted to rest. I'm standing there, and I feel this, but at least now I know what's happening, so I'm, I'm at least smart enough to agree with it. Now, I didn't go talk to her, but I can agree, yes, in Jesus' name. Yes, you be healed. That's it. <clears throat> so I'm standing there, and it wasn't two minutes. And all of a sudden, I heard her stand up and look at her mom and say, Mom, I'm, I'm feeling better. If y'all still want to go to this thing, we can go, because I, I, I feel fine. I feel fine. Well, I hear that, you know. And now is when you really want to go, well, here, let me tell you what happened. <clears throat> you know. But it's too late then. You understand? It's too late. Easy to be a prophet on 9-12. Should have been one on 9-10. You understand? Anyway. So it's going out. So now this is unusual to me. So I'm thinking, okay, this is weird. You know, not, not normal for me. Didn't say anything. Went home later. <clears throat> Went back, started working. I think it was about, it was a little bit later after that. And I was working on my laptop. And I had a little television there. And back at this time, it still had VHS more than DVD. And some people had sent me a videotape from Africa of a healing service. It was on this videotape. Now, this videotape was over a year old, right? A year ago, 
this happen. So I stick this thing in, I'm playing it, but I'm writing, so I turn down the volume, and you know how you kind of let something play and you kind of watch it, but you're really working, and if you see something interesting, you'll turn it up or whatever. That's kind of what I was doing, but I was sitting there writing, and there was a healing service going on, and it was average, kind of, you know, no, nothing stood out at first, but then all of a sudden, I felt, just like here, but it was here, and instead of one hand, it was like both hands. Just like that, right up toward the television. So I'm writing, and I feel that. And again, I, you know, I'm not really given to feeling things. So when I do feel something, it stands out. And so I'm writing, and I felt that, and I just looked up. And right then, on this video, was this young boy that had a huge cancer. I mean, a growth. It was horrible looking. And right when I looked up, they were praying for him, and bam, and this literally, it was like someone just exploded. It was gross. I mean, blood, and it was gross, okay? But just exploded. Well, when they cleaned the boy up, he was perfectly healed. Perfectly healed, all right? Now, I'm sitting there. I feel this. I'm looking at that. It's a year old. So I just ask God, what, what's going on here? What is this? What's, go, what's happening? You ever notice he never answers a question except with another question? You're, every time you ask Jesus a question, he always answers with a question, right? So I say, well, what, what is that? And the first thing he said is, Remember the times when you were in a life-threatening situation? Yeah, there's been several like that. Yep, okay. He said, what happens when you talk about it? I said, well, <clears throat> the, the more detailed I get, the more I relive it. And if I do it right, then my, <clears throat> my heartbeat will speed up, my blood pressure will go up, my breathing will get shallow. Why? Because that's the fight or flight syndrome. That's what's going on in you. You start to gear up for what's happening. And when you talk about it, you relive it so your body reacts to it. Right? Now, this will explain a lot about the anointing, too. Sometimes the anointing getting spiritual. It's more physiological interaction of what you're expected to do and stuff. So anyway, <coughs> talk about that later. So I'm answering, and I said, so the more I remember it, the more I talk about it, the more I relive it, and the more real it gets. And, he, and that's whenever he said, the Holy Spirit in you is remembering when he healed that boy. Now, understand, I, I had nothing to do with that. I wasn't praying for the boy. This happened a year ago. The boy was healed, right? I had nothing to do with it. But the Holy Spirit in me was remembering when he healed that boy. And I thought, okay, literally, I'm telling you what was going on in my head. I'm thinking, God, this is weird, and I need scripture. Because I, I told you, I like scripture. I said, God, you got to give me scripture on this, because this is just too weird. The amazing thing was, he gave me a scripture that I have actually preached. It, you, don't you just love it when he does that to you, you know? And he gave me a scripture I'd actually preached on several, I mean, several times, hundreds of times. And it was out of Romans chapter 8. And it says, if that same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Then he, usually what I preach is the next part. He will quicken your mortal body. That's what I always emphasize is he'll quicken your mortal body. He'll heal you. That spirit of God will heal you. But he didn't do that. It was like he put it on a loop and played it over and over again. And he kept saying the same thing over. If that same spirit that raised Jesus, Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Stop. Back. If that same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, stop. If that same, just literally over and over and over. And I know when he does that, he's trying to get something across to me. <laughs> All right? <clears throat> he's, just, he's not just repeating himself, okay? And so he keeps repeating it, and then it hit me. If that same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and then I got it. The spirit in me is the same spirit that raised Jesus. Not, that's sharp, isn't it? I mean, you just pick that up that quick. <laughs> okay, now. <laughs> but the amazing thing was, I realized he wasn't talking about just raising Jesus from the dead. All right, has there ever been a human heal anybody? No. Who did it? Jesus, actually, was the spirit of God. Jesus said, even the works that I do, even I don't do them. But the spirit of my father, he does it. Remember? Even Jesus didn't take credit for the works he did. He gave the credit to the spirit. So every healing that ever took place, one person did it. The spirit. Right? Then I started getting it. The spirit that's in me 
raised Jesus from the dead. The spirit that was in me healed that boy. Matter of fact, every time anyone has ever been raised from the dead, the spirit in me did it. Now, I might not have been there, but the spirit that's in me was there. In other words, there has never been a healing, ever. There has never been a dead raising. There's never been a miracle that took place that the spirit that is in you didn't do it. Do you understand that? And then all of a sudden I realized that ends the idea of being ready. Right? Well, I'm not ready because, you know, I've never been in a situation like that. That's okay. The spirit in you has been in every situation like that. The spirit in you, if it's ever been done, he did it. And then I started realizing this thing is easy. Why? Because the, the one that has the full knowledge of everything the one that knows every situation and has healed every sick person and every bit of it lives in me. And when I realized that, <clears throat> then I realized it wasn't about who was laying hands on that boy. It was about the Spirit of God that healed that boy. And what I was feeling was the Spirit of God, while I was writing, he was watching the video. <laughs> and he was remembering when he healed that boy. Isn't that something? That's the spirit you have in you. You get that? See, you don't have a little Holy Spirit. You don't have a piece of the Holy Spirit. You got him. You've got the one that's done every, every miracle, every healing, every bit of it is in you. He is in you. The fullness, now get this, the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells in Jesus Christ. Is that right? And Jesus dwells in you. So who's in you? The fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him. You hear that? You are complete in him. Now that doesn't say you are completely in him. Meaning well, I'm totally in Jesus. That's not what he's saying. He said in Christ you're complete. You know what that means? You lack nothing. That means you don't need an anointing. You don't need an impartation. You don't need something added to you. Why? You are complete. <clears throat> my, I, my granddaughter, my newest one, born six weeks ago, eight weeks ago now, I guess, something like that, almost. And <clears throat> when a baby's born, the first thing you do is count everything. Isn't that right? You look at them, oh, they're, you know, until they clean them up, they're not pretty, but once they get them cleaned up, they're pretty. And, and as soon as they're cleaned up, first thing you do is start counting everything. Count their fingers, count their toes, right? How they look, everything's there, everything's working, okay, good, okay. Yeah, when, once you do that, what do you say? Oh, they're complete. Good, they're complete. Isn't that right? Are they grown? Are they, are they full grown? Are they finished? No, they're complete. See, they're born complete. You were born complete. You understand? You were born again, complete. You don't need anything added to you. Now, will she grow up and learn more as she goes along? Yeah, but she's still complete. You know, she's not half a human. She's human, right? Why? Because she's whole. She's complete, right? You were born again complete. Now, as you grow, you learn how to use what you have. As she gets older, she'll learn how to use her legs and start trying to walk. As she grows up, she'll, she'll learn actually how to coordinate her hands to put her hand, well, she already knows how to put her hand to her mouth, that's for sure. <clears throat> but she'll know how to use it with a spoon, you know? Why? Because you have to learn how to use what you got. Even though you were born with it, you still got to learn how to use it. See, your problem is, you were born with it, you just don't know how to use it. My job is to show you how to use it. But I'm not here to give it to you. Right? Why? Because you've already got it. You were born with it. You can't find one place in the New Testament where it talks about anointing, special anointing, double portion anointing, anything. You can't find it. There's nothing in the New Testament about it. The closest you can get is over in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. It says that you have received an anointing that abides it lives in you and dwells in you. It doesn't come and go. There's nothing about anointing coming and going. And then the beauty of that is you're already anointed. You're anointed now. You were, now listen, you were, now listen carefully. I'm fixing to mess you up. 
okay? <clears throat> you were born again anointed. You say, well, 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 what was the baptism of the Holy Spirit? That's when the Spirit came upon you. That's not the anointing. There's a difference. The anointing is not the Spirit coming upon you. Okay, you don't look like you believe me. Well, I'm not going to tell you because it's time to take a break. But when we come back, I'll explain it to you. Okay?